For a while now, I've been curious about how on Earth movies with extreme budgets continue to be produced while losing enough money to fund illicit wars. The Flash, Indiana Jones, and Ant-Man are just some of the biggest losses this year, within recent years, reaching legendary sums that may even lead to Disney itself needing to be sold off like a cheap hooker. After a hearty plate of research with a side of discovery and drink of exploration, I realized the totality of the subject matter I want to jump into is far too big for a single video. So I'm gonna tackle it in bite-sized pieces so that people with bigger brains than me can digest it gooder. So this is going to be the first video of many breaking down much of how the Hollywood machine operates, and we'll begin with movie budgets. Right out the gate, if you're looking for definitive numbers, you will often not receive that answer. While some are accurate, the majority of the numbers I'll go over in this series are either underreported or non-disclosed for various reasons like the US budget. Actors' contracts could have an NDA preventing the publication of how much they were paid, or some of the investment money can, under Section 181, allow for $15 million in tax write-offs. So yeah, I just want us to be on the same page about the margin for error being wider than Patton Oswalt before I get started. Alright, movie budgets are not as simple as they appear. In fact, the old profit equals box office minus budget is an oversimplification, leaving out more details than redacted documents. A movie's true budget is comprised of three different budgets. Production, marketing, and distribution. These do not make up the total, so whenever you look at a website like Wikipedia or IMDb, the budget reported is exclusively production, and by the end of this video, you'll have a much better understanding about why a movie like Avengers Endgame didn't cost $400 million. Rather, a billion. Let's just work through this list, starting with story rights. If a movie is based on a pre-existing property, like a game, novel, or is an addition to an existing story, whether it be a sequel or prequel, you gotta pay to use it. Just an example, but Michael Crichton was paid one and a half million, and that was before the book was ever published. And whether a studio has the rights or not, the heart of any movie is its writing. The script, or screenplay, is the reason for a movie being good or bad, and to get the best, studios can expect to cough up between low six to seven figures, or in the case of Illinois, a shed. And that's not including rewrites. Uh, a script doctor can be paid a medical student's debt worth to save a troubled production. Of course, a project needs a lead communicator between the different departments and staff, and that's the producers. Executive or otherwise, these folks are often paid within the six-figure range, so they can basically tell people what other people are doing. Some of the highest earners get upwards of a million along with the share in the profits and bonuses, probably so they can smoke wine and drink cigarettes on a beach somewhere while fandoms go to virtual war with each other like Kathleen Kennedy. She gets paid 2.2 million a month to ruin some of your favorite franchises. And that's fucked. So underneath the producers, you have directors who are thankfully some of the simplest in this list. Studios can begrudgingly relinquish 5 to 10 million for a good director, not including a share in the gross. Steven Spielberg was paid 10 million to direct Jurassic Park, but smartly took back-end points resulting in 250 million dollars. And then there's actors who also have options when working on a film. First, you have the Screen Actors Guild, or SAG, paying actors in that union a variety of ways based on the production budget. If a production budget is over 2 million, then actors make 2300 a week, and that doesn't include the contract negotiations. Actors can ask for upfront payment participation in the gross, and perks, like trailers. Depending on the actor's star power, this can be as little as dropping hope in a bucket, or an extra packet of used cigarettes for a producer. For example, Robert Downey Jr. was paid 500000 for Iron Man. But for Endgame, he was paid 75 million. That's almost a quarter of the production budget. And that's not to mention union extras making as little as 130 a day. That ain't something to scoff at for people like us, but it certainly feels like a ripoff, don't it? Next, production costs, and they range dependent on what you're going for and are extremely difficult to pinpoint. Since the economy fluctuates and most sets are 90% green and 10% blue, the majority of the time smaller props and costumes make up the most of physical production now. Now the other major cost is the visual effects. Depending on who you go to and how much effort they put in can range from six figures or even seven figures on the low end up to, in the case of ILM, a hundred million dollars. That's insane. 
And what's an adventure without a little music? Interestingly, music production with composers costs about the same as producers, even for original works, with the higher end equating the low end of well-known musicians. For example, Celine Dion makes over $600,000 in royalties alone. And that's all production budget. So next, we have marketing, like distribution, which is fairly simple. Needless to say, if you have a movie, people have to hear about it, and this is where ads come into play. Physical or digital, they are everywhere, like a swarm of locusts, but necessary to get our asses in seats to make money so that desperate Hollywood execs don't have to suck on the end of a 12-gauge in a month. In addition to physical and digital ads, this budget also includes test screenings. That was interesting to learn. For an average cost of $1 million per film, audiences are allowed to see a movie, finished or otherwise, and rate it. Sometimes this turns out well in the case of Blade, while others can result in entire rebuilds of a movie. Lastly, merchandising, and this is where studios hope to preemptively mitigate losses by offering licensing to video game studios, toy companies, you name it. We really have Star Wars to thank for this one in particular, as at the time, no one had ever done something like this, and it revolutionized merchandising and licensing forever. Let me put this in perspective for you. The total box office of all 11 films in the franchise is $10.3 billion. The total gross for all merchandise? $35 billion. Yeah. And at an average of 50% of production or more, depending on the movie, of course, possibly equaling the production budget or far exceeding it, like A Quiet Place, this is how many franchises make their money in the long run. Otherwise, if Star Wars had failed at the time, George Lucas would be remembered alongside Jimmy Hoffa. And finally, we reach the last budget, distribution. Thankfully, this one's shorter. Distributors are paid to broker a deal between theaters and studios for how many screens a theater will pimp out. Of course, this cost can be avoided if the studio owns its own distribution company, like Disney owns Walt Disney Studios Motion Pictures. But if not, then the studios have to go through a middleman. There are two primary models, leasing and profit sharing. Leasing is simple, the distributor agrees to a fixed fee to distribute the film, while profit sharing allows for distributors to take a bite of the net profits averaging 30%. Regardless of whatever deal is finalized, movie theaters almost always pocket 50% of the total box office as well. So with all of that understood, we can plug in some conservative estimates. As is publicly reported, we'll assume Avengers End Game's production budget was a whopping $400 million. The marketing campaign was one of the biggest in history, so the average 50% budget can realistically be bumped up to equating 100%, meaning an additional $400 million. Then slap on $200 million, as confirmed by Chris Evans on Ellen DeGeneres' show, and Avengers Endgame cost a monumental $1 billion. And if you are in disbelief, Here's an article by Deadline discussing the break-even point at 1.1 billion. Now, with those numbers plugged in, if you recall, I mentioned movie theaters keep 50%, half of the box office gross, and distributors an additional 30%. Disney's own distribution company handled Endgame, so the mouse avoided that hit. Nonetheless, these numbers and estimates within reason can be applied to other movies, so you can now understand why movies like The Flash's incredible $300 million loss makes sense. Again, this is only one of many more videos to go over about how this movie machine works, and as I do research, I'll make more videos to explain things over time, along with the usual reviews and other discussions. But until then, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.